So in this session, we're going to uh, kind of move outward into the planets. Uh, I hope I've got the sequence right. And uh, we're going to begin with Scott Larson, who I invited here because I wanted to know how did a sober specialist in corporate finance, somebody who has advised other people on sensible business practices, structuring and restructuring, get caught up in a mad scheme to provide the world's first near live HD video feed of Earth from space. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little about, uh, to tell you all just a little more about what we're doing here at EarthCast. And uh, basically what we're doing is we are uh, building, launching, and operating the world's first ever uh, high-definition streaming video platform of Earth from space on the International Space Station. And so what that means is that we have signed an agreement uh, with the Russian Space Agency, and the general framework of the agreement is that we're going to give them two cameras. They provide the launch, the, on the installation on the outside of the International Space Station, the power, downlink, and maintenance of these two cameras, I and mean, then we're going to split the data. They take the data of Russia, and they're going to give it to the Ministry of Forestry, Agricultural, Farming, um, Urban Planning, uh, City kind of stuff, and then we're going to take the data of the rest of the world. And we're going to do, I mean, we're going to do uh, two things with that data. One is we're going to sell it and give it to people who want pictures of Earth from space, which is called the Earth Observation Industry, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And secondly, we take the data, process it, and stream it in as near real time over the web as we can, and then open up an API and allow other developers to make games, apps, educational type tools based on pictures of Earth in near real time or, as, or, uh, or uh, close to real time as we can. And so uh, here's a little bit on the International Space Station, of course. It's the most expensive man-made project ever. Um, they've spent about $100 billion on it. And there's five different agencies involved, Canada, Russia, European, uh, NASA, I mean, then the Japanese Space Agency. Uh, it goes around Earth I'm about 16 times a day. Most satellites, of course, go like this over the poles. And the space station goes from about 52 degrees south uh, to 52 degrees north, traveling at about 25,000 kilometers an hour, which is about seven kilometers per second. And so as Earth turns like this, the space station just kind of swivels around like that. Um, 52 degrees south covers uh, South America, South Africa, Australia. It gets everything at the bottom, and then we miss out northern Canada, northern Europe, and northern Russia. I think Toronto is about 45 degrees, so we will be over Toronto about uh, three to 400 times a year. Russia spends right now um, about $10 million a day on the International Space Station, so it is uh, super expensive. Uh, here's a little more in the cameras. Uh, so this is a medium resolution camera. Uh, we're working with both MDA, uh, out of Vancouver, I mean, then there's a company in the UK which is called Rutherford Appleton Labs, which is uh, just outside of Oxford, basically one of the world's leaders. Uh, MDA is building the back-end electronics, and the folks in the UK are basically building the lenses. So this camera is about this big, it's about this long, uh, it's pointed directly down, and it, it takes a 50 kilometer wide swath at what's called five meter resolution. So wherever the space station goes, it takes this kind of endless panoramic image that, um, that basically goes on forever. And at five meter resolution, it means anything that's five meters big you can see. So buildings, roads, rooftops, uh, fields, farms, agricultural, you know, that kind of stuff. You basically use it for, um, for wide area coverage. And from a space uh, from a camera in space standpoint, this is actually pretty standard. You know, there's nothing that's really, uh, there's nothing that's really too unique about it. Uh, this camera here is much more unique, and this is a video camera. It's about this big, it's about this long, and this is at one meter resolution. And it's mounted on this pointable platform that we can swivel around and direct and hold. So if you imagine the space station is going over Hamilton, it's out in the suburbs, the one camera is pointing directly down, basically taking a picture of kind of whatever it sees, this camera here, if we decide there's something over downtown Toronto that we want to image, we can, uh, we can point the camera over, hold it for about 90 seconds, and take a 90 second video at uh, one meter resolution. And then as it gets too far past Toronto, you know, then it goes on to Montreal, or Boston, New York, Chicago, and we'll take about 150 of those videos as the ISS goes around Earth every single day. Uh, so at uh, one meter resolution, anything that's one meter is big, cars, buses, groups of people, boats, planes, that type of thing. Uh, you'll never see the guy mowing the lawn in the backyard. Physics kind of get in the way of that, but you'll see a golf cart, white on green. Um, cameras are in the final stages of being built. Uh, they're being um, 
uh, they're being put together in the UK right now. Actually, here's a picture that we got out of Russia uh, just last week. I mean, this is the Hydro Lab. So outside of Moscow, they have a full-scale replica of the International Space Station underwater. And they train the astronauts or the cosmonauts who are going to be going up on the type of work they're going on the type of work that they're going to be doing. So if you see uh, the top camera there, uh, and that's the high resolution on the video camera, it's much bigger. And then, I mean, then the camera that's kind of in the middle there, uh, that's the medium resolution camera. And you can see the cars went off to the side. It's a, you know, kind of a weightless environment. So they train them underwater so that they know what they're going to be doing when they get to space. Uh, cameras get shipped to Russia late this summer uh, from uh, they get packaged and they go through some, through some final kind of certification kind of stuff. They go from there to Kazakhstan, which is where they get launched from, and they get launched late October, early November on a Russian rocket like this. And then from there they go to space. It's about a six or seven hour trip up to the International Space Station on this capsule. And then a couple weeks later, they get taken inside and then they get installed on the outside of the International Space Station. Um, the reason, actually, that we're going up in November is because the Russians are taking up the Olympic torch, and they want to time our launch, our cameras, with when the torch is going to be in space. So they're going to do a spacewalk with the torch. Russians love space, and of course, they have the Olympics next year, and they're taking the torch up and so forth. So um, kind of cool, right? So there's, some, uh, so there's some neat marketing stuff. Uh, before I get into the rest of it, I'd like to tell a little bit kind of how EarthCast started. Um, because I think it is unique, and maybe it answers, answers some of Moses' questions about uh, kind of the genesis of it. About four years ago, my brother worked for one of Canada's premier aerospace companies. And the Russian Space Agency had been asking this company for a couple years for, um, uh, for a camera. I mean, they wanted a radar camera to install on the outside of the space station, basically for a science project. And so they'd been asking this company for a couple years for radar, and there was no way that this company was going to send over a radar camera to Russia. Uh, radar is expensive. Uh, it's a little sensitive. You can see through clouds at night, you know, that kind of stuff. And the Canadian government probably would have blocked the export of that technology outside of Canada. So my brother, who headed up sales and uh, basically business development, was sent over to Russia to tell the Russians that they're not going to get a radar camera. And so he's meeting with the Russian Space Agency, and they said, OK, well, fair enough. Well, uh, what else do you have? And they began a brainstorm kind of throwing out stuff. All space agencies need to justify their existence to the taxpayers you know, and show that they're doing good stuff. So uh, around about the same time, off of Vancouver Island, on a little island called Hornby Island, there's a guy who had a tree on his property, and some eagles had came and built a nest on his property. And this is kind of three years ago. And what he had done is he'd crawled up the tree one night and basically stuck in a webcam on this nest and then was streaming it over the internet. And it was spectacular. There was, there was tens of millions of people who were following what these eagles were going to do, when the eggs were going to hatch. And it was, it was uh, low activity, but incredibly addicting because there was, because there was a sense of, uh, what if I miss it? Anticipation, basically, which is what the internet is all about. And so um, in a moment of, uh, of, of inspiration, uh, my brother said, how about if we just throw up a couple of webcams and we'll just stream it over the internet and just kind of see what happens? And the Russians loved it. They said, that's exactly the kind of stuff we're looking for. Uh, if you can do that, it'd be perfect. So he came back to Canada. He talked to his company. And his company goes, ah, too early, too internet, too startup. You know, that's not the kind of stuff we do. Um, you know, we build companies. We don't, uh, or we buy companies. We don't build companies. And they passed on it. So he came to me, and my background is in a combination of tech and finance. And he said, A, is this a good idea? Does anybody care? And B, do you think you can raise, you know, kind of 500 grand from some buddies to seed it, do some kind of technology study, go to Russia, meet the Russians, and so forth? And I said, yes. And so we did. So we incorporated the company. Um, uh, we incorporated about two and a half years ago. Uh, we're based in Vancouver, and we've got about 35 guys. Uh, 25 are in Vancouver, seven or eight down in the States. Um, we spent the first six and a half months basically kind of working with the Russians and making sure that we had that, you know, uh, that figured out. We spent the, and the same time working on the space segment, who's going to build the cameras, what type of technology, and so forth. And then we spent the last two years basically building the business, fundraising, marketing, uh, the revenue model, and so forth. Uh, we've raised about $11 million, and next week actually we're going to IPO the company here on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and that'll fund the business as we move forward. Yeah, thank you. So when the cameras go live, uh, and as we stream it over the web platform, um, the idea is, is you, can, you, know, I mean, you can go to the website. It's entirely free. You enter your address, and you see a picture of your house taken two weeks, eight weeks, 15 weeks, kind of 30 weeks back and forth in time. And you can scroll back and forth and see how things have changed. 
rivers, environment, you know, the farm, that type of thing. At the same time, because we know where the space station is, you can enter your address and find out when it's going to be above you next. It'll be above you in five hours and 59, 58, 57 minutes. You can walk outside and organize your event around when you'll be imaged from space. <laughs> so, you know, so you get all your buddies in white shirts on a green field spelling out, I love you, will you marry me? Um, on top of that layer, because we have the medium resolution camera and then we have the high resolution uh, uh, video camera, we overlay basically the social media on top of that. So Facebook, Twitter, Yelps, check-ins, any kind of wiki type information that has any kind of geolocation component to it, we can drop that down onto our map. And then what we do is we crowdsource content. So we want people to upload their own uh, images. So if you're inside this hall here, you take out your phone, you take a 360-degree video of the room, you tag it, uh, downtown Toronto, you know, Idea City 2013, you upload that to the platform. The next time someone types in downtown Toronto, they get the image from space on the medium resolution, they get the video showing some movement, they get, um, they get the inside view. Uh, if you're in the Sistine Chapel in Italy, you take a picture of the ceiling, you tag it, and the next time when someone types in the Vatican, they get the down, and then the local view. And the goal is to image everything. We want to image everything. We want to image the house, the office, the school, uh, the buildings, the churches, underwater, everything. Um, I feel that everyone in the world is going to want to come to the website once. If you can see Earth from space, why would you not? And um, the idea is, uh, and with Facebook, you follow you know, your buddies from university. Uh, with Twitter, you follow someone who you think is kind of influential. And with Earthcast, you end up following a location. So here's uh, w one of the other things we're doing is we're going to be having a camera mounted on the inside of the space station, kind of looking outside, zoomed out, if you will, you know, kind of a low resolution, streaming basically 24-7. And it's going to look something like this. This is a video that NASA put out. It was basically some guy who took his camera from space and I mean, basically took a bunch of still images like this, and then they stitched it together to create this image. So this is coming down uh, on the west coast of... Uh, 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 South America, you can see clouds, lightning, there's the Amazon there on the left hand side, there's a couple of lights in there, and then the sun rises and sets uh, 16 times a day. And it looks like this. Here's it going down Florida, of course you see Florida at the bottom, getting down into the Caribbean, you can see lights, islands, roads, you know, bridges, things like that. Uh, Central Europe, it's all lit up of course, you know, there's lots of lights there. Uh, that green thing is the horizon, you know, that you can see. Uh, here's uh, southern Europe. You can see Italy. It does, in fact, look like a boot. You can see uh, Turkey, Greece, Cyprus. Uh, here we get down. Uh, on the top right-hand corner, the, uh, that's the Nile into Egypt. So it's spectacular. And then this is the northern lights. And this is what they look like uh, from above. And it turns out they look better from above than they do from below. So it's spectacular. And if you notice in the top, uh, if you notice in the top right-hand corner there, there was a little video of the of the Canada arm. So here's a quote from Yuri Gagarin, who was the first man in space: "What beauty! I saw clouds and the light shadows on the distant dear Earth." Actually, a quick story: the first time I was in Moscow, and I was meeting with the Russians, there was myself and another guy. There was about 25 Russian engineers, and this elderly gentleman by the name of Viktor Legostayev walked in. And he gave me his business card and said, hero of, the Soviet, uh, hero of the Soviet Union on his card. And I thought, that's an incredible title to have on your card. <laughs> so it turned out that he was the guy who designed the electronics for Yuri Gagarin's first flight into space. And so uh, as we went for lunch afterwards and we were doing some toast and so forth, he stood up and he told a joke. He goes, there was an American, a German, a Russian, and a Canadian who had escaped from a prison up in northern Russia. And they're running through the forest trying to get away. Out of, uh, out of the blue comes a bear, jumps on the American, kills him. So, so now it's the German, uh, the Russian, and the Canadian still running. Pretty soon a wolf comes out, jumps on the German, kills the German. So now it's just the Canadian and the Russian running through the forest trying to get away from this prison. Out of nowhere comes a tiger. He's just about to jump on the Canadian. The Russian pulls out a gun, shoots the tiger. And so the Canadian goes, if you had a gun, why wouldn't you have shot the bear or the wolf? And the Russian pulls out a bottle of vodka out of his jacket and said, well, I've only got enough vodka for two people, and they don't like to drink alone. <laughs> so
so uh, space is popular these days, of course. There's, and there's lots of commercial space companies. Um, you know, we've got Virgin Galactic taking people to space. We've got people wanting to mine asteroids and so forth. And then we've got Chris Hadfield, who just spent about five months up in space and was dropping the pucks at the Leafs games and uh, sending down some all kinds of great pictures, uh, including this tweet where he said, I talked with Neil... T uh, Talk with Neil Young tonight, he and his hybrid 59 Lincoln, me and a spaceship. And when it comes to tweets, it's really tough to beat, you know, that kind of emphasis. The other thing that we're going to be, be doing, basically, is uh, giving the information into the Earth observation industry, which has been dominated by satellites that cost about three to eight hundred million dollars. Uh, our cost of the cameras is about 5% of that. So other satellite companies need to charge $20,000 in order to make some of the money that they spent building the satellites. With us, because we spent just a fraction of that, we can, um, uh, we can actually give away the imagery and we can look to make it elsewhere. And so uh, one of the things we wanted to do is we signed an agreement with the UN. They reached out to us last spring. I flew to Geneva. We met them there. And they want to use it for, you know, kind of uh, educational, um, crisis monitoring kind of stuff. We're talking with other nonprofits who want to monitor the forest and media companies and so forth. And so when you come to an industry with this kind of disruptive cost structure and this kind of partnership that we have, there's really, uh, it opens up all kinds of possibilities of things that you can do and how you can turn that upside down and the, and the, and the, and the education and the environmental awareness that you can uh, generate from that, I think, has the, uh, has the ability to turn that industry upside down. So when you talk to astronauts, and I've talked to four of them, and they go up and they say, you know, they've been to space, they come back basically fundamentally changed. Looking at Earth from space changes them. And when you talk to people who have gone up twice, once, you know, over, over, over a period of eight years, they come back with an understanding of how the Earth changed. And these are just an example of some of the types of pictures that we'll be sending down, and uh, I'm streaming over the web. And the idea is, is that as we... Um, uh, astronauts always have a different view of what um, Earth means. And so pictures like this, EarthCast's goal here is to take some of the astronaut's perspective and bring it down here for the rest of us. And so I said earlier that space is popular. It is popular. But what is even more popular these days, of course, is Earth. And I think EarthCast has the ability to take a little bit of the astronaut's perspective, bring it down to all of us here on Earth, and hopefully incorporate some of that into what we're doing. Thank you very much.